Today we're going to be talking about uh, Sepulcher's Desert or Paradise. Uh, we have selected a new 10-page chunk to look at. Uh, Opalin is playing with the images today, and uh, it it's like, okay, so, so there's two things to kind of mention before we get into the main podcast and uh one of them is is like okay this image so we so the we got a kickstarter coming up on us uh, for the new skip book and uh when we went around looking for people to make the kickstarter video uh a a, a couple of guys uh, that are animators said that they wanted to do it and uh, um, so they've been putting together this kind of a super rough draft kind of an animation, which a lot of people are like, why do you call this a rough draft? It looks ready to go. <laughs> and, um, uh, they have apparently tons of ideas that are coming up in the later versions. But near the end of the video is this image, um, which I think is kind of a fun image. Um, uh, let's see, I can, if I could activate this uh this annotation thing i have the ability to kind of draw so um mike some of these are obvious like i can tell that this person is uh jennifer that one i'm i'm sure about and i can tell that this one's lara and that this one is sean um oh and this one is definitely mike and this one is definitely fred but um uh i think i heard that this is nicole and this is ashley and this is dave burton <laughs> and uh, uh this is ash and uh this is raven sure so who's this mike said he sent my photo over to these guys too so he thinks it's me okay so this is this is opalin all right all right um <laughs> so uh oh and then of course there's me in the middle um yeah who's that giant guy yeah and uh i don't know for for those of you that have met me you could confirm or deny whether this is actual size like uh like are they exaggerating my size <laughs> maybe a little maybe a little i think they're i think it's exaggerating your width Although honestly, I haven't seen you recently, so maybe, but um, uh -huh. they're not exaggerating the height. <laughs> so actually Dave Burton and Sean are, I believe they are both taller than me. Oh. Yeah. You yeah. got some small people out there. <laughs> So, uh, and on the, on the call today, we were supposed to have Mark. Mark is actually taller than me, Damn. which, you know, it's pretty rare. I, I think it's very rare that I see somebody in the wild that's taller than me. Um, uh, and then I've had uh, several people comment that I'm the tallest person that they've ever met in all their lives, which I think is odd since I see people that are taller than me once in a while. Yeah. All right. Um, it is it is unusual. It is crazy. But all right. Um, I think that the video is fun. So I take it everybody has seen that little video. I haven't yes. seen the video. You haven't seen the video. I have. Okay. And Mike said that he got an updated version about 15, 20 minutes ago. So it may come out soon. What did you think of the one that you have seen? I thought it was super cool. <laughs> yeah, I think it's fun. This is going to be so cool. All right. So now uh, we're going to get on to Desert of Paradise here in just a moment. And uh, we were on the greenhouse call to look at the greenhouse update. And um, uh, we were talking while waiting for things to begin. And uh, there were some suggestions for future podcasts. And one of them was for um, Obligation is Poison. I don't think that that's going to be much of a, of a podcast. It would be just... I mean, a whole minute or two. I, I don't know. I mean, I can tell a story about how I kind of came to this conclusion, but I'm sure we've all been there where we have an obligation and it's like, Jesus, this, this obligation is just, just making us miserable uh, for whatever reason. And uh, I kind of, uh, um, I, Okay, so first, agreement, 
everybody has kind of been there. You've got some kind of obligation and it's just poisoning your life to, to bully through and do it. Yes, especially if it goes longer than expected. Yeah, I yes. think if it's something that's short and simple and quick, not so bad. You can, you know, spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down kind of a thing. Bully through, get it done and get on with your life. But when you've got a big task ahead of you and it's an obligation. And so I kind of, for me, uh, the Kickstarters, when I do the Kickstarters now, it's important to me to have like pretty much everything is done and then do the Kickstarter. Um, we did some Kickstarters in the past where um, we lined up, I, I'm thinking of one right now, we lined up the videographer and the moment the Kickstarter was done, the videographer said, I quit. And, um, you know, and it's like, what? We did all this because we had a videographer lined up and, and I don't care. I'm out. And so, um, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's just a powerful poisonous thing. So now I feel it's really important to do Kickstarters when we kind of have everything done. Now, the last one we did where um, we didn't have anything done and, uh, and Josiah had to take that on. And I think that's been really, so just, I mean, I have 100% faith that Josiah is going to come through, but I also feel like this is acting a bit as obligation as poison for him. Now, when you have a great day or a great, you know, moment on the project, then it, you know, that kind of washes away for a bit. But overall, I think it's, I think it's tough. I think it's tough. So, um, I know that, that, uh, Opalyn and Katie, you guys were talking about like, yeah, go ahead and, and, uh, um, do a podcast about it, but I don't think there's enough there to fill a podcast. Um, the stories that I have to tell are not that interesting. Um, I mean, they're interesting. They were software engineering stories, but um, I do feel like it's a problem that I personally have in my life. And so I try to find a path. In fact, everybody on this call supports my Patreon. And mm -hmm. so many people believe that Patreon should be set up. And most people set their Patreon up to be like the patrons put in a certain amount per month, no matter what. But then I feel like that that obligates me to create something worthy of that coin each month. And that's a poison to me. And so I, I would not be involved with Patreon at all if that was the only way to do it. So instead, I have it set up per artifact. Mm -hmm. And that works for me. And in fact, people can put a cap on it. They can say, I support at $1 per artifact and a maximum of $1 per month. And it's like, that's fine. I mean, I kind of, it, it gets to this whole other thing of like, uh, now the podcast, you know, I get to a certain point in the month, the podcast now cost me money to produce. And so I'm gonna, I, I'm not much interested in making another one. <laughs> you know, so it's that more- Right, as the month goes on each, item earns less because people drop off as they reach their maximum. Yes. 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 So this is an obligation is poison thing, which is why I set it up that way. And mm -hmm. I'm, you know, so I'm, I, I can do Patreon that way. Um, I, I don't think we'll do another Kickstarter like the one we did the last time where I mean, I kind of feel like it would be cool to do like the um, Freezer Wafati project mm -hmm. like that. Um, but it's just it's just too much obligation is poison um, kind of a thing. Uh, so I don't know if if this last one had gone really, really fast and then we were all done and it was just gobs of fun the whole way, then sure. What the hell? But um, it has it has gone on, and so it's like nope, no, 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 don't do that again. Yeah. All right. Are, I'm really, um, yeah. I'm really curious to find out some more solutions for obligation is poison. Obviously, for small tasks, like it doesn't like you can just say do it or not do it. But for a larger task, especially like 
like, well, like building a Wolfati is a huge task. How can you get it done in a good way if you're not using obligation as poison? Um, what what works? I I would have to say I I have kind of come up with a bunch of different little things, but for building a Wafati, I would say that the number one thing is going to be um, like with the um, skip stuff. We've got the the lick program where um, so like suppose that you're going you're going to build a Wafati and you've got 20 people that are going to build it with you. And then as part of the lick program, like if it takes a month to build it, then each of those people that put in a month, they get to be in line to have their Wafati built with 20 people. Does that make sense? But then they're obligated to help all those other people 20 times. Oh, wait, how does that work? But th there's still oh, no, it's there's where's the obligation? I mean, they could basically it's like, all right, let's say let's say right now we're building your Wafati and I come and I spend a month helping you build your Wafati. I have no obligation to show up. I could quit any day, no harm, no foul, right? So there's no yeah. poison there. And then a next one is being built and then I can show up and help with that or not. But if I keep showing up and keep doing it, then eventually it's my turn and I get the Wafati build. Now there is an obligation there for me to show up and lead my own Wafati build. But by this point I've built like 19 of them or something like that, or maybe it's six, I've built six. And now it's my turn because so many other people went down that path and then they opted out, which is their, you know, they can do. Um, and, uh, uh, but now I'm going to build mine. Well, it, it makes sense. This is an obligation, but, but that's the beautiful thing too, is, is that for doing something on this scale and you're going to be building it with a bunch of fun people, it's, it's not so, it, 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 it dilutes the poison a bit, but still you get a Wafati out of it and you get to hang out with a bunch of fun people. So it's like not not so bad but you do have at that point you do have the obligation to show up to your own piece of land and build your own wafati <laughs> and all these other people you know show up to help it sounds like um, you're saying that the queue and everyone like is, is the first person to get there is first in line and the second person is second the kind of thing and then as more people show up and start building wafatis they get to be put at the end of the line and then some people might drop out, so that might scoot you further up in the line. But hopefully there are enough people at the end of it when it's your turn, it's not just you standing there. Yeah. No, I I mean, if, if you've maintained the lick, then yes. And that's a risk that you take. So it's possible that you will have shown up to build six different Wafatis, and then it's your turn to have people help you and there's nobody there. So all you got out of it was experience. You got, you now know how to build a Wafati uh, from top to bottom because you've helped build six of them. That's true. So maybe part of it is like setting your expectations that that is one of the things that might just happen and you're sort of okay with that at the beginning, then you're not upset with it at the end. Does that sound like I'm describing it correctly? I, I think that that's fair, but you're right it's entirely possible that nobody will show up for the next build. And, uh, but I, th I think that uh, it's also possible that too many will show up for the next build. <laughs> and so um, I, I think it's, I, I think the lick program is, is pretty solid and pretty cool. Um, but yeah, there's, there's the risk that it won't, it won't pan out. I think it's good. I think that the, you're right that the experience of building Wafatis with experienced people, that's awesome. And if, if that's like the, what you're expecting you to get out of it, that's a pretty reasonable expectation. And so then when you've got that, the other stuff is, is just considered um, like a possibility, but not a guarantee. That sounds great. Um, so that sounds like a, a great kind of solution. That's, I love to hear more of these kinds of solutions. Um, what about for like software stuff? Well, I, I think that, well, for software stuff, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down the road of like um, the Kickstarters that I do with somebody. 
and so for example i wrote that book with sean and um basically in order to get rid of the obligation is poison thing then our agreement is is that once the books are printed and shipped then our obligation ends and we each get an unlimited distribution license as opposed to like for a lot of people where they're co-authors it's like you know we're going to have this complex algorithm to determine how much money each person gets and how and why and all that stuff and then um uh and then quarterly a person has to do a bunch of accounting in order to determine you know how to square up with the other party and stuff so there's an obligation there but if we each have an unlimited distribution license then i can go and and sell copies on permies and sean can go sell copies on amazon and all these other websites and it's like we each have our own thing and now we have an un i could go sell them i could go compete with sean if i wanted to um and I could, uh, you know, so I've got, because we both have an unlimited distribution license. So, um, but the thing is, is that no obligation, no obligation to, to have this relationship continue. Um, so that's, I, so you're saying, what could it be for software? And I feel like um, if you're gonna be developing with others, a project like that, it could be some other thing. But for me, for software, uh, I wrote Bananacom back in 1993, and then I think it was like in 94 or 95, uh, somebody gave me some money to make a Windows version, and I started like exploring Windows because Bananacom was in DOS, and I started exploring development for Windows, and it's like, what a nightmare. Um, I just kind of felt like everything about this is wrong. It's It's like such terrible engineering micro microsoft windows is like uh, a just just a shit storm it's a dumpster fire i'm amazed that for at least at that time which at that time i think it was windows 3.1 eventually windows 95 they were they were both just such a dumpster fire i i'm surprised software would even work on them um but uh, uh i just hated it I just hated it. And somebody paid me in advance to go and uh, make a Windows version. Now, um, I did do it um, in a way. No, wait. I think for that guy, I contacted him and I gave him all his money back. And I instead, I took the DOS version and got it to work better under Windows. And then later still, for free, I made a version in the Java programming language, which was brand new at the time, which is a dreamy language. And, uh, and so, I, it, in fact, it didn't take me very long to develop the software in Java. And I made that available free to that guy. Um, but um, it, was, it was just killing me to work on, on the version for Windows. It, I just, I mean, oh, it was so awful. And I just, I just kind of felt like I... I, as a developer, do not want to touch this mess with a 10-foot pole. That was my big obligation. This place. And that's when I kind of came up with the thing, like this thing, this, this obligation is just poisoning my whole life. So do you think if you hadn't accepted any money at the beginning, like, so was the, was the order of operations that, like if you had said, okay, I'll look into it, and then you start in on it, and then you're like, no, this is terrible. <laughs> Goodbye. Um, yeah. but, if, but since you had accepted money, you felt like you had to. Um, you like accepted the job. You said you'd do it. Yeah. So, so the way to avoid that maybe would be to have, I don't know. How, so how would you have done that differently? What would have been the right? Because if you if you just say if you just do it, and then maybe they don't pay you. Oh, and that happened a lot, where I would develop software that worked great. And they loved it. And they just kind of had this thing where it's like, you know what? If I just don't pay you, I'll, I'll have more money. And uh, so um, I kind of, I developed a career that was such that it's like, I'm time and materials. And I had, 
I don't know, hundreds of people tell me nobody works that way, then I guess you got to go hire somebody and I'm nobody. And so um, don't hire me then. And I was, I, not only did I get a lot of work, but I ended up getting paid obscenely. Um, so I did, I did extremely well. Uh, just, and then people would complain like, well, how do I know you're going to do it? You don't. <laughs> so, um, hey, uh, people hire me, I do my thing, and I get paid. And it's like, uh, um, and, and basically it was like some companies, I knew that they'd pay me, so I would just send them invoices and they'd pay. Uh, other companies, I was a little skittish, I was a little worried about them, and, and so I required a retainer. And uh, they did that, it was all cool. But yeah, there was a lot of people that were like, no way, there's no way anybody would be okay with that without getting some sort of guarantee. And I'd say, good luck, bye. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, but I, I was at the top of my game. I could, I could command that, no problem. Well, I'm, okay, so you're super good at that. That's awesome. Um, but I'm also looking for something that works for people who are normal at things. <laughs> and it sounds like what you're saying is if you had a retainer, like let's say you don't know them that well. So you can't do this thing where you're like, I'm going to do it first and then you're definitely going to pay me at the end. But you could do, okay, let's put a retainer, but I'm not guaranteeing I'm going to look into it. I'm going to schedule time. I'm going to start in the project and then we'll work together and it's not, there's no obligation. So just to, to maybe to keep a spirit of openness about um, that there's not an obligation. Is that, is that something you think is a good idea? I, I don't know. I feel like, um, I, I feel like the obligation is poison thing is so severe with me that I live my life this, this alternative way, which I think most people just cannot do. But then again, the other side of it is, is that I've got so many residual income streams right now that it's like if I stop doing it or, you know, change gears and do something else or whatever, it doesn't matter. You know, I'm, I'm going to be fine. But for a lot of people, they have families to feed and stuff. And it's like, uh, I got to get coin to come in. And so, um, it's like, and then, and then for some of the stuff, it's like, uh, I'm going to go do this wild hair thing and, uh, I might get paid and I might not get paid. And so I can't, I can't take that risk. I know that there's a lot of people that want to work with me on Kickstarters or, or projects or whatever. And it's like, their whole thing is, is that they want to get guaranteed payment for the work that they do, whether the Kickstarter is a success or not. And they want a big fat slice of the pie uh, if the Kickstarter does really well. And my response to that always has been, it's like, it's good to want things. Just go right ahead and want that. You're not going to ever get that from me, but you just go right ahead and want that. If you want a big slice of the pie, then if the Kickstarter is barely funded, that means I have to put money in. And if you're going to be getting as much money <clears throat> out of this as me, you're also putting money in. You're putting in the same amount of money I'm putting in. And so then that's a, that's called a gamble. It's a risk. And if you're taking the risks, then you get the big reward. But if you're not taking the risks, then you don't, you don't do it. So the people that want guaranteed income, then it's kind of like, uh, then, all right, if the Kickstarter does great, you don't get anything more. And they're like, no, I don't want to. And, and anyway, <clears throat> I think we've wandered a little bit away from obligation is poison. But for a lot of people, um, the path that I take to avoid obligation is poison <clears throat> is is a, a path that's that's just too weird. Path of uncertainty. Say that again. It's a path of uncertainty. It is a path of uncertainty. Um, but that's cool. I mean, it's a path of adventure. It's a path of living large. <laughs> Quite large. I mean, look at all the experimentation I do. 
I do an enormous amount of experimentation all day, every day. I take risks like crazy. And, um, but, but my life is fucking amazing. Um, whereas the people who play it safe and they, I mean, they need that worky job. They, they need that. Not only do they need that that guaranteed income, they need to work at a place where they can kind of feel confident that that income is going to come in week after week for the next five years, no matter what, you know, and all the insurances and bennies and perks and all of that. And on top of that, they want the flexibility to pop over to a, to a whole different company on a whim, you know, they... They will not allow the company to rely upon them as much as they rely upon the company. So for most people, that's the way they live their life, which I don't know is, I guess it's kind of exciting in a way, but a lot of people want the benefit of living large without the risk. And it's like, good to want that. You go right ahead and want that. See how it works out for you. The bottom line is, is, is if you don't take the risk, you don't you don't have the adventure. So um, I don't know. I I sent out an email to a hundred thousand people yesterday, telling them about how I dropped the price on twelve books to to sixty bucks, and I think I had three people take me up on the offer. I thought there'd be like three hundred people doing it um, um i'm hoping that people will buy books for earth day and then give them out like crazy on earth day and make a big difference i was wrong i took i gambled and i lost and so it, bummer but hey um try 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 it some more um anyway well thanks for talking about it okay we have some was that enough? Obligation is poison, man. So poison. So <clears throat> I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if I have anything else to say. Maybe if we, if I did a formal podcast, I'd make notes and and have a richer message. But but there. You I go. feel like you've done a lot with the with the um, all the people on. Oh, sorry, I'm blanking. Um, well, all the people who come to work and stay. Um, I forget the different program names oh no um Boots, the boot camp that's yes i'm remembering old names and i know they're not the right name anymore um and and you worked really hard to make it so that there's sorry so that there's the least obligation is poison as possible and you've got you've come up with some really cool systems for that but you've already talked about some of those but i feel like there's more there so i just have to think more about the areas that i i remember stories about that you told and i'm like that's brilliant but at the moment uh i still got Okay, well, I, I kind of thought we could just touch on a little bit of that stuff before jumping into the meaty podcast of the day, um, because they're just kind of like micro podcasts kind of tucked in there and then and then we'll move on. But but if you get more questions about obligation is poison or um, and I know that that uh, both you and Opalin were saying that I should talk more about the boot camp. And some of the things I've mentioned in the in recently about the boot camp, and I kind of feel like, yeah, oh, cool, we could do that. But let's do that another time, I think. Maybe I'll record something with the boots to talk about these things. Um, <clears throat> and the two of you, it was so kind of you to, you you kind of said a lot of very encouraging stuff to try to convince me to make a lot more podcasts, and um, uh, we'll we'll see how that goes. Maybe I will. <laughs> all right uh now desert or paradise by sepp holzer and um mm -hmm. so kind of selected pages 27 through 37 for this podcast um uh this first bit i've got a big chunk i want to read that's from the from page starting on page 27 and i've i think because it's such a big chunk i've i've been very careful to select very little after this but um all right let me just jump in when i dig a well too deeply i extract the water from the earth 
and it refills from elsewhere deep down. I keep sucking until water runs out and the whole area dries up. When all the water is gone, I simply dig a new well, deeper by 600 meters, and then 1,000 meters. Sadly, that is common practice nowadays. Then what? Eventually, all the groundwater is pumped out until the next water coming up is from the coast, out of the sea. 20 or 30 kilometers means nothing here. The well is salty. First, it's just a little salt, and the well owner thinks he can cope, but eventually it becomes pure salt water. Now the soil over the whole area is salinated and lost. You cannot get rid of the salt in the ground. People are forced to move to another piece of land and start over. The same thing will happen all over again. The human is like a migratory locust destroying whole landscapes. This must stop. And people have to act at the first sign of the wells running dry. Instead of digging deeper and deeper in order to get water out, I actually have to add water. I have to give water back to the land. The underground reservoirs must be allowed to refill. Okay. Oh, look. We've got images of it. <laughs> All right, way to go, Opalin. Yay. All right. Um, the next the next bit I want to talk about is the the project in Spain, which is on page twenty nine. Does anybody have anything to talk about? Anything to say before that? Uh, no. Okay. Uh, to 30 kilometers is 12 to 19 miles. Oh, thank you. All right. Um, it does, I mean, the idea of digging a well a thousand meters, I mean, that's 3,000 feet deep. I, I just can't, I've never heard of a well. I've heard of a well that's a thousand feet deep, and I've always kind of suspected that there are wells 1,500 feet deep. But the idea that there might be a well 3,000 feet deep is just mind boggling. We have neighbors that had to dig a thousand feet deep because we're up on a hill and that's the water table of the river. So yeah, I've, I've, I know of people who've done over a thousand feet, 1,500 feet, but I don't know anybody who's gone deeper than that. Yeah, it's just, it's just bizarre. Okay. Then he starts talking about the project in Spain. And um, the land there is owned by Princess Lechtenstein. And um, I, I'm pretty sure I've talked about this in a podcast before, his, his project in Spain, where there's all those old oak trees. And, mm. um, and basically, it sounds like the princess hired 20 global experts to come and um, uh, each take on a section of this giant property and um, reverse the desertification and save the trees. And uh, to hear Sep tell it, it's like the other 19 experts would all come to Sep's plot just to tell him that he's doing it wrong. Um, but, uh, uh, Seb talked about, and he's got a picture of it here to prove it, but um, basically it's like uh, you go to this area and uh, they've been abusing the land for centuries and the oaks that are there are, are centuries old, but they're clearly very sad. They are not doing well at all. And so... Um, Apparently, a bunch of experts or somebody somewhere said, well, since they're all doing poorly, 
they must all therefore have a virus. And now when I first heard Sepp tell the story, he said that they did have a virus, but they got the virus because they were being treated so poorly that their natural immunity was weakened. But in, in the book, it's, it's like his story is, is that they didn't even check to see if there was a virus. They just said, it must be a virus. So then um, they went and they, they put a port into each tree so they could inject each tree with something. I don't know whether it's an antibiotic or what, but to give basically to give each tree a shot to cure it from this virus. And, um, uh, and so there you can see in the book, there's a picture, this injection port. Uh, so they were, and the, and so everybody was, was asked to spend um, uh, $3 per tree per injection per year. No, not $3, three euros. Three euros, more like $5. Yeah. And then it's like, if you got a bunch of trees, boy, that's going to rack up fast. And so he basically said, like, how are you going to how are you going to be able to run a viable farm if you're spending that? And uh, the way that he describes it in the book, it's like, you know, it, it's the dumbest thing ever. And I and I kind of feel like even if there is a virus, it's dumb. But, yeah. the, you know, especially if I could put on my not. doctor hat, I'm I really I imagine that that this is um, they're putting in a. Um, what is that called? What are the pesticides? Because they did it for the emerald green um, ash borer in Wisconsin. You would inject the tree with a poison that would make the entire tree poisonous. And then that was supposed to kill the, the ash borer. So it wasn't a vaccine, but there are things that you inject into trees to try to kill the bugs that are chewing on the trees. Right, and so Sepp went into a lot of detail in the book, and I'm I'm trying not to read too much of the book, um, yeah. and uh, but he was basically like, well, let's let's see what we're what we're doing here. First, we're going to surround the tree with a monocrop, and uh, and we're going to plow the hell out of like where the roots are for the tree, so the tree doesn't have a chance to really do its roots. Then we're gonna we're gonna just suck all the organic matter out of the soil, turning it into cement. Uh, which in turn exposes the roots of the tree. Um, and so then the, the, it looks like the, the tree is, um, it, it looks like the tree is kind of growing up. In fact, he kind of talks about in, in here how fields are growing rocks. <laughs> and, and I like the way that he says that, how, how it's like you've got to feel, and the rocks are growing. And then the farmers are like, how is it that the rocks are growing? How, how is that even possible? And, and of course, his explanation is spot on. And I know I've, I've talked about that in, in this podcast before. Mm -hmm. um, and so what it is, is that the, the so it's not that the rocks are growing, it's that the soil is shrinking. As the organic matter leaves the soil slowly over decades, then um, the size, the overall size of the soil becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. So it's like the soil is sinking and the rocks are still sitting in the same spot. So it looks like they're growing. They're growing out of the ground. Um, and the roots of the tree are basically doing the exact same thing. Um, and of course, what? And then, and then I read in here that it sounds like on this property, here it is, Nora von Lichtenstein. I'm going to pretend I pronounced that correctly. And uh, it sounds like the Oaks did not make it, but um, they uh, there's much, much more growing mm -hmm. there now as he's restored all this land. Yeah. All right. Uh, I'm going to read something uh, at the bottom of page 33. Has anybody got anything that they want to talk about before that? Yeah, I had something on 31 where he was talking about um, intensive overgrazing is another example where damage is caused. 
Spain and Portugal have a long tradition of extensive grazing, but it was mostly done with pigs in the past and they actually helped the ground. And I just thought I, it was interesting. I, I, I kind of feel like if you do paddock shift with pigs or cattle or sheep or goats, any of the animals that are being discussed here, you can, you can improve the quality of the land. Yeah. But right, if you just leave the animals in there, they will completely obliterate it. And maybe um, the pigs are so obvious that even people who aren't thinking in a systemic way know that they have to move the pigs. Like they um, so obviously dig things up and so you'd have to be really stupid not to realize that, okay, I need to move these animals. I'm wondering that too, why is it better? I don't, I don't want to say really stupid because I don't think it's really obvious. Um, but yeah, if you've got the pigs in your area and they've obliterated everything on your entire property, I mean, it's going to be really hard to visit with the neighbor and say, do you mind if I come and obliterate your property too? <laughs> you know, as opposed to the idea of telling them like, well, if you broke your property up into like maybe six paddocks, it would actually, you know, thrive with that. Well, I think, then, but he's saying they traditionally did graze with pigs, and I'm guessing traditionally it, there weren't fences. Even they were eating the acorns, and they were just moving them through the through the oak forest, just continually moving them. Because he was descri he's describing like 300 years ago, Spain and Portugal had pigs moving through this area, and that didn't ruin everything. It's only in the past you know, 100 years or 50 years that things have gotten messed up. Right. There's, I believe at the beginning of the section, isn't there a quote from, uh, it says, it says, uh, it doesn't, I'm not sure if it says what the timeline is, the Greek It's from 1992. Yeah, the book says that you used well, to be. Well, yeah, but that's the new, but then the used to be, when mm -hmm. is the used to be? The Greek geographer Strabon. Yeah, who knows when Strabon wrote that? Before, before people had last names. Yeah. Yeah, so long hundreds ago. of years ago. Yeah. Once wrote that a squirrel could hop through the trees from the Pyrenees to Gibraltar without ever touching the ground. And uh, so now, of course, he's pointing out that it's a kind of a shithole. So, yeah. Um, All right. I the the key is is like maybe I mean of course if it's an oak tree it's going to put out a bunch of acorns and then it's like why not let the pigs eat that, um, but then it's kind of like if if you can get the um, the pigs to keep moving and I'm and when you're saying that like oh maybe they moved the pigs through and they just moved them you know saying yo pigs stop being there and now I want you to go over there and i'm kind of thinking like how, how did you do that julia <laughs> yes, I, I want to hear all about that one yeah and if the pigs say fuck off then what do you do <laughs> all right so it looks like opalin found this dude strabo oh look at that 63 bc he was born so <laughs> right around year zero, maybe a little before year zero, he was like, Squirrels, yeah, all the trees, you betcha, so many trees back in the good old days. All right, I'm gonna go on. Has anybody got anything else before page 33? I really like how he said it's not necessarily the trees that have the virus it's the humans it's how we're thinking about or not thinking about um the impact that we're having on the trees and the soil and and all the different components and i i think i think it's so important for us to recognize because of course sep i mean yes in fact when i read that i'm like man that's that is so sep <laughs> that is that is that's up all right yep um 
uh, and I kind of feel like um, I I love the idea that Sep gets his plot to do it his way, and the other nineteen guys suck, and Sep's is great, and then once it's done and it's magnificent, then then they can they can uh, uh, figure out like what's what what works, what Sep is trying to say, and what he's trying to accomplish. But I mean, of course, the humans don't actually have a virus. <laughs> but it is true that you know they have they have made some fascinating leaps, and and of course, Sep also says, "Why is it that they've got to you know glom onto this crazy idea when the obvious problem is right in front of them?" Well, it's obvious to Sep. And I think, I'd like to think that people have been listening to this podcast for a while, it would be obvious to them. It would be obvious to everybody on this call, like what happened. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's, it's uh, in fact, yesterday when we were talking about, I was kind of saying like, you know, some days I just don't feel like anything I have to say has that much weight. And you guys are like, well, no, you, you know, and, and I, and on there's these days where it's like you end up talking to somebody and it's like this person doesn't have a fucking clue they there's so much that they don't know this is going to take me decades of thousands of little bits of information until they will understand i mean it's like it's it's as if they got to do all of k through 12 and uh, college to a master's level again until they can understand what i'm even trying to say which seems really simple to me but it's i sure i'm sure all of us have experienced talking to somebody where it's like oh wow this is you know i there's no way i'm going to convince this person in 10 years no way there's we would have to go we have to go so far back to the basics that this person has clearly never understood the, the foundations of this conversation. And so then the only thing really to do is to just step quietly away. And so then I, when I talk to somebody like that, I kind of feel like, I feel like I do have a lot to say. I, I got to talk about all this stuff, all these little tiny bits, millions of them to be able to just, convey what's in my head so that maybe the person that I was just frustrated with could maybe someday understand. And of course that person will probably never listen to my podcast. Um, but, but most of the time, if I'm visiting with somebody who is savvy about this stuff, I feel like, yeah, it's all, it's all really obvious to all of us. And so I'm not really bringing anything to the table here. We all know this stuff. And, and so why should I make a podcast of stuff we already know? It's like, it's not, it's not anything profound. It's not any big deal. So um, Sep, on the other hand, gets really upset. And, um, you know, it uses the word catastrophe a lot. <laughs> and, and I think, I think really um, people just don't get it. They just, I mean, it, I mean that the solution is a pretty simple one. Paddock shift stuff is is pretty simple, and the results are really profound. And yet, um, I think most people won't believe it until they actually see it. And and then once they see it, then it's like, oh, okay, that's cool. I want some of that. But until then, they're going to put all their animals in one giant paddock and then just destroy everything. All right. Yeah, as, I, as I was reading about the trees, it sounded very much like all the different stresses that the bees have been subjected to. And if we just stopped stressing out these trees, they'd be fine. Yes. Yes. And, uh, you know, care for their soil a little bit, maybe. You know, um, that would probably help a lot. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, and, but then that's another thing too, is it's like, um, these, 
these experts. It's like Sepp Holzer went to ag school and then he came back to his land and started applying the things that he learned in ag school and all of his stuff started to die. And it wasn't until his third year of ag school that he decided not he decided to go back to doing the stuff when he was seven, that, that you know, doing the stuff that he was doing when he was seven, rather than doing the stuff that he learned from ag school and to do his own thing instead, because the ag school stuff is obviously not working. And so, I don't know, you get these experts together and they, they got their stuff about, you know, what is expertise and things and then, um, you know, what is the right thing to do? Mm -hmm. And it's like, yeah, and yet everything kind of dies. And so their right thing to do, the thing they figured out was let's give all these trees a bunch of injections. I imagine somebody probably got rich on that idea. But all right. Notice in all those erosion pictures that are up right now that, oh, wait, no, one of them in the middle has some trees but it looks like they took away all the trees on the sides and that's where the erosion is. But, but um, uh, most of them are, have no trees. Oh, nope, there's another one with trees off to the, the top row to the right a little bit. Second from the right. That one has some trees back there. And the first one on the second row, or I guess the second one where it says uh, environmental science, that looks very similar to the photo that um, is on page 34 that we're talking about how removing the trees causes less water to infiltrate and just oh, yeah. causes more and more problems. Trees are, are the magic ingredients. Yeah. Okay, flood prevention. Flooding, like desertification, is not a natural disaster but the logical consequence of human error. These two are the dramatic symptoms of a globally disturbed hydrological balance. Wow. So, um, so Zach Weiss has a, a movie he's working on, which is really amazing. It'll be very short but really amazing. Uh, and uh, he's been working on it for ages. I keep wondering when he's gonna come out with it. Um, he's doing too much work, like actual yeah. physical digging work. He's, he's in demand now. He is in Man, demand. I remember when he met Sepulcher and he wasn't in demand at all. <laughs> he, was a, he was a greenhouse building guy. Right. Yeah, that's what he used to do. And now look what he's doing. Cool story. All right. So um, an, another thing is on page 36, I'm, I was looking at this and I'm, I was kind of thinking like, no way. And so apparently there was a hillside mm -hmm. that had a bunch of erosion. And they're like, we will stop the erosion by spraying concrete on it. Mm -hmm, I've seen that. It's horrible. And I kind of thought, really? That's... Somebody thought that was a good idea. And uh, Sepp's note is that it actually makes it worse. That makes sense. It makes sense that it would make it worse. Yeah. Um, wow. All right. I have no more notes up through it. And I can, and on chapter, on page 37, um, there's a, a new section title there. And I just kind of stopped right there. So we'll pick up next week at, on, uh, on page 37. But do you guys have anything more to add on this? I kind of feel like I didn't have a lot to say about this segment of the book, mm -hmm. um, partly because I'm excited to go on to the next stuff and, and uh, um, partly because I kind of feel like I've, I've, like I've heard the Spain story so many times already. I feel, and I feel like I'm confident that we've shared the podcast before. Yeah. I like the, he's got a massive picture book of um, all the stuff he did in the Spain project. And the picture book is just amazing. I don't happen to own the picture book. I don't know if it ever became for sale. And if it did, it was probably never in English. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. cause I'm not familiar with that, but you saw it, huh? And it was just gorgeous. I, I saw it when Sep, when Sep showed it to me. Yeah. So I saw it with Sep, Sep sitting right there 
jabbering away in German and pointing at pictures. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, there, I, I think there was an interpreter there telling me a little bit of this and that uh, as it was going on. So, yeah. um, oh, we're pulling up Zach's uh, uh, video. It's my video, isn't it? Isn't that a vid my video of Zach? I think this is the evening talk from the 2017 permaculture course. Okay. And um, I would, anybody interested in, in this topic, like Zach's lecture throughout that day were phenomenal. And they're like, I want to go and spend days like piecing, parsing out everything that he was talking about because it's just so fundamental. Yeah. In fact, uh, I want to, I want to do this real quick. So, so Katie, I had a, I had an exchange of emails with, um, uh, Alan Booker and, uh, um, basically, uh, since the, the PDC is now sold out, um, uh, and we had a bunch of people saying that they would like to get it videoed. They'd like to see Alan's PDC that I turned to Alan and I, I basically said, well, you know, maybe, what do you think? And, and Alan, Alan basically said that he's got some ideas for something much richer, but it might take a few years to develop. And I was kind of thinking like, um, you know, like the equipment that we use to make the video for the PDC for what Opalin's, you know, pointing at right here, because it's like, so here, this is a one hour and 11 minute presentation by Zach Weiss. And it's kind of like, um, if we set up like five video cameras and then later did the editing, that editing would probably take two weeks. And instead what we did is we had this software that does like live editing, like what they use for football games and the like. So it's like you just record and then there's a person there and they just pick which camera they're going to go with right now and which microphone and and stuff like that. And they're just kind of actively sort of kind of editing on the fly, which I think turned out pretty good. Um, and Alan said, he, he said, well, what would be the point of making yet another uh, one of these. So we've got a hundred hours for this PDC, including this presentation. And uh, what would be the point we, when this one's quite good? And uh, granted, his style is more intense. So Katie, I don't know if you if you've seen this PDC video or not. Did have you seen it? I think that I have. If we jump forward, I can recognize for sure. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think I have seen this. Okay, so. Um, and, but, but you have attended an Alan Booker PDC. And so the thing I suggested was, is like, okay, let's, let's do some more staging, uh, make the background look prettier and let's get some better lighting in there and, uh, and basically do the exact same thing. Like, so we'll just have better lighting, better staging, better visual, and then do it again. But this time with Alan teaching it. Yes, do that and break it up into pieces. An hour long is it's too, you gotta, it's too much to like, when you start listening to it, you're like, this is amazing. But but they'll think they can't take a break. I don't know why this is, but I feel like if it was a series <laughs> on YouTube rather than a giant, it's just a little giant. Um, when there's a lot of, um, well, there's a lot to, you know, it's a fire hose. So, for the 2017 PDC, we have a hundred hours of recorded video, and um, uh, and I guess then we would have two different PDCs for which we would have approximately a hundred hours of video. Um, I was thinking like maybe we should do that. Maybe people would like it, and um, and Alan was kind of thinking like nah, nah. I've got. He wants. He's got. He's got his. He's got a, his brain set on this much richer formatted thing, and uh, but it's going to take a long time to develop. Um, and I kind of thought, well, this could be uh, an interim thing, maybe. Nah, nah. So, um, 
I don't know. I I thought people would be up for it, but he thinks that uh, there there won't be enough interest to be worth the effort. I'm not a good judge of people's interests, but I'm a good judge of my interests. I think it would be excellent. I would love to go back and see, um, like you said, with the different cameras, one exclusively on like the screen or 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 chalkboard or whatever is being the, the background focus. And one on the person as he's telling it, he has some really awesome stories that are very engaging. And it'd be great to have it him, the camera be on him for those stories. And then at the different materials, I think uh, having the different cameras and having the lighting and having it be framed well, I think that will make it so that someone who's just browsing around YouTube would stop and say, hey, look at this. And if it's, I mean, if it's hundreds of hours long, maybe there'd be certain parts of it that would make a really good like tiny clip that could lead to buying the rest of it or like but it maybe be a 20 minute video but it um it showcases a certain part of it um but if it's well done i think that would draw people in um i i think it's worth the time and energy but uh if he doesn't want to yeah no 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 um uh i i think you mentioned alan telling stories and it's like when alan tells a story it's it is concise and it has an, it, it proves something in the end. And so, um, but all right, setting that aside, I think uh, I think we're done with Desert of Paradise for the day. Uh, yeah. Has anybody else got anything else to add about this section that we've read? Yeah, if it's okay. Um, saying, I wanted to, I wanted to say something. If it's if we got another yeah, moment, yeah. yeah, say your thing. Yay. Um, I've been sort of looking at this, hearing the story about uh, when the, 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 it, was, it was doing great for the squirrels back in zero BC or whatever that was. Um, and how people don't really step back. People have like day-to-day -day emergencies. Like I really need to get the diaper changed on the kid and I really need to get all these sheep over here before the storm comes in. And I really need to get this year's harvest. And they're not, like, it's been working fine. I mean, it's, it's sure the rocks are growing a little bit, but mostly everything is fine. And they weren't there in zero BC when the squirrels could run, jump from tree to tree across the continent. Um, and I think some of this stuff happens at such a, like a, a step out level where you step out and you really look and you really feel and you have time. And I think the kind of lifestyle you're talking about um, when you're saying obligation is poison, you're saying I've, I've made room in my life to step back and do things a way that's really thinking about the parts and really, really making space for experiments and, and seeing the bigger picture. And I think that a lot of times people are not able to make that space to, to step back and say, hey, look how these trees are eroding. Like it's, this tree has lived through this terrible process for 50, 100 years. It's been slowly dying, this hundreds of year old tree. And uh, I think it's sometimes hard to step back out of ourselves and see this bigger picture. And yeah, I think it's really important. So I, I can sort of see how someone living there over the period of 10 years, well, it's another drought this year. Uh, I could see that happening. I, 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 uh, I kind of feel like um, a lot of the permaculture stuff is about reversing desertification, which is what I believe this book is about. Um, and so the way that it's going to catch on en masse is if there's going to be um, dozens of demonstrations of it. And um, I kind of feel like a great demonstration of it would be to like just build a single hygge culture in the middle of a desert and, you know, plant it full of jungly things and and get it started, and then once it's started, then walk away and let it be a little micro oasis there. Um, it's just, it's it's, and that's a that is a persuasive element. I mean, everybody has the power of observation, um, and not everybody has the power of imagination. So, I think that there are fewer people that can imagine or, or fewer people that can believe it from reading a book or, or whatever. And, um, and there's only a few people also that are willing to take the risk and make the leap and, and prove it even on even doing a small version, a little 
quarter of an acre before taking on 20,000 acres. And so a big part of it is, to try. so there's people like you're saying, it's like, oh, it looks like it's gonna be a drought again this year, just like the last seven years. This one may even be worse than the previous six years or whatever. Um, I kind of, I kind of feel like, um, shouldn't that be indicative? But I understand that people are, are not going to connect the dots and instead they're just going to move away. So I don't know. I, I suppose that as permies and I kind of see, I kind of feel like this happens a lot in the permaculture community. There'll be an area that is that is turning into a ghost town and deserts. And then a whole bunch of permies jump in and then turn it into a lush jungle. And and uh, you know, but they pick up all the land for cheap. Smart. So smart. So I don't know, does this is this a response to what you were saying about? Here come the droughts. Oh, it's a drought again this year. Yeah, thank you. All right, anybody got anything else? I'm hunting for the button to hit the hit the stop a All right, if you like this sort of thing, come out and out to the forums. I'm like still trying to find this button. Where is this? Oh, there it is. Wait, why did, it's like when I moved to the button, okay. If you like this sort of thing, come on out to the forums at permies.com where we talk about the mighty, the glorious, the amazing settlers, homesteading and permaculture all the time. All the time.